All right, so everybody, welcome to the class. Um, unfortunately, I will not be able to arrive in our... I'm sorry, somebody texted me. Okay, so unfortunately, I wouldn't be able to come into class today, mainly because I am doing something, uh, I'm doing something for emergency purposes. That's the reason why I'm recording this video in advance. So hopefully, future me will do a wonderful job. Sorry, 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 sorry. Somebody texted me again. Okay. Um, yeah. So let's continue on with our discussion about the gram-negative microorganisms, specifically Escherichia. Okay. So let's begin with the first question. Most common diseases associated with Escherichia coli are four things. You just need to remember. UTI, sepsis, meningitis in infants, and diarrhea. Of course, when we talk about diarrhea, the most important uh, parasite, or sorry, um, gram-negative organism that you got to talk about is E. coli, okay? Actually, what is being tested in the water is not um, other micro or other microorganisms that belong in the family Enterobacteria sheath. It's actually just Escherichia coli, hence the term coliform bacteria, okay? So, yeah. So, most common diseases, okay? So, don't forget those four most common diseases, UTI, sepsis, meningitis in infants, and diarrhea, okay? Now, meningitis in infants are associated to E. coli and may be correlated with what, one, what, Glansfield, what Lans, Glan, uh, sorry, Lansfield group of streptococcus species. It's actually group B, streptococcus, streptococcus pneumoniae, okay? All right, so... The meningitis in infants associated to E. coli and it can be correlated to what Lansfeld group of strep species. So please don't forget our previous discussion, the group B streptococcus. Okay, streptococcus, particularly group, uh, particularly streptococcus pneumoniae. Now, let's talk about the biochemistries of um, E. coli, right? So indicate the test results for E. coli with the following Okay, so Invic and TSI. So don't forget your Indole, Methylene Blue, Vogue's Proscour, and your um, Citrate test, okay? Plus, as well as your TSI. So please don't forget, this is the must remember. It is, a, it is a must remember slide of any of your slides that you will encounter in our discussions or in any of our future discussions. Specifically, when you're diagnosing E. coli, you must remember the Invic reaction of E. coli because it's wealth. A, it's a high yield. Um, it's a high yield question. Um, I think seventy percent of the time, or the examinations that, um, or exam questions associated with E. coli's biochemistries, going to revolve around um, its Invic result and its TSI result. So please, please, please don't forget this particular slide because it's negative, negative, positive, positive for Invic. So it's just four tests. So please don't forget these four tests. Okay, methylene blue, uh, sorry, indole, methylene blue, and vogue sprouts cower and your citrate test. So TSI is triple sugar iron agar. It's acid over acid, okay? This is your, um, this is your, an example. This is the, this is the summary of the result. Okay. Now there are five types. There are five types of E. coli, or what we call strains of E. coli. So I'm going to summarize it for you guys one by one, and the reason, and we're going to discuss later why each of these subtypes, or rather, um, zero groups. I think they're now referred to as zero groups. But in the exams, when I was still studying, eh, for your exams, all you need to remember is that there's five types of E. coli that you need to remember. Otherwise, come back to this, come back to this video or to your notes related to the slides if you have if you have a hard time remembering them, or you have a hard time remembering what is the important points to uh, to understand regarding these um, zero groups. Okay, so the five types are are as follows: enterotoxicogenic E. coli. Enteroinvasive E. coli, enteropathogenic E. coli, enterohemorrhagic E. coli, and enteroaggregative E. coli. So from the names themselves, what's the difference, sir? From the name, you can differentiate it from the name them from the names themselves. Okay, so enterohemor enterotoxicogenic basically relates to it's to, uh, it's a, a subgroup that uh, uh, that is accentuated by the toxicogenic uh, capacity so it could be in the form of 
Um, it could be in the form of a food poisoning. It could be in the form of food poisoning or any other um, toxicogenic related um, uh, disease, disease or disorder that may be associated with E. coli. Enteroinvasive is of course the motile, the motile version, okay, of E. coli. Okay, when they go beyond the trenches of your um, GIT tract, they might exit outside the they might exit the, they these are the strains that are capable of traveling or result uh capable of um migrating outside the digestive tract and enteropathogenic enterohemorrhagic and enteroaggregative are basically the same uh, basically the same things usually they are related to generalized um generalized diarrhea with with the, inc with the inclusion of um with the inclusion of bloody stools for enterohemorrhagic E. coli. Okay, now among the five types of E. coli that we just discussed, which is considered to be non invasive and cannot produce a toxin, it's the EPEC or enteropathogenic E. coli. What is the most common pathology associated with this type is what we call the infantile diarrhea. The most common appearance of stools of these types of patients have watery mucoid diarrheic stools. Diarrheic stools. So, when you see it in case presentations, you might be asked which of the following would most likely be the subgroup of E. coli related to this case of patients. So if you see that the patient's, uh, that the patient's case presentation includes the age, of course, so the, page, the age of the patient may be one or two-year-old or three-year-old patient with diarrhea that has been that has been um, that has been hospitalized for three or more days, hence the term nosocomial, with a characteristic watery mucoid diarrheic stools that are negative for parasites or uh, negative for no, negative for worms and um, negative for helminthic parasites and amoebic parasites, then you might need to consider enteropathogenic E. coli, depending on, of course, the uh, biochemical findings, okay? So please don't forget, in the exams, you're not going to be tested on how much information you memorized. It's how much information you memorized and how much of these information can you discern, okay? How much of these information can you, how, how, how the quality of the information that you can discern in the exams okay so please be mindful of this one so that's the reason why i put this in bold text so you guys can remember all right please don't forget those things now let's move on to your um to the next topic in our agenda um the next um slide of course uh, differentiate the two types of toxins released by epic What's EPEC again? Enterotoxicogenic E. coli. So there's two types. Again, there's heat labile and heat stable. Heat labile is closely associated with a cholera-like toxin or cholera-like toxin. And then the heat stable one is related to increased fluid secretion. Basically, that it stimulates. It's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's a heat stable toxin that increases the net fluid secretion in the large intestine. That's stim by stimulating guanylate cyclase. I'm not going to delve deep into this, but what you need to remember is that EPEC is the one that is capable of releasing toxins, specifically two types of toxins, cholera, a cholera-like toxin, which is the one that is heat labile, and the other one, which is heat stable. Uh, if it's heat stable, it's related to the, si the stimulation of the guanylate cyclase, thus which results to the increase in net fluid secretion. Okay, now, what is the term associated with diseases um, caused by ETEC? You have three, you have three, you have to remember these three, th three th terms. Okay, usually it's found in Mexico, um, in Mexican, um, the, origi the origins rather of, of the disease association is or, um, from Latin America. The traveler's diarrhea, Montezuma's revenge, and Turista's disease. These are the common terms that you might, uh, uh, that you might correlate with the ETEC. Um, again, this is not um, this is not going to be as important as the other slides that I've just mentioned, but just for your information, okay? So you might encounter a uh, patient suffering from traveler's diarrhea, for presumptive traveler's diarrhea. Findings are as follows, blah, 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 and then indicates what is the causative agent of traveler's diarrhea. See? 
So it could be an it could be an it could be a uh, um, a question that is pretty straightforward. But what you need to remember is to familiarize yourself with the other names of the diseases as well. Okay. Now this is the type of E. coli that's associated with the Shigella-like Shigella-like infection. So Shigella-like infection. Shigella, Shigella infections are pretty much um, notorious, or Shigella infections are notoriously similar to E. coli, but the only difference is the fact that it tests negative for many of the, te many of the biochemical tests that we just discussed pre in the previous chapter of our discussion. But E. coli is, of course, invic, positive, positive, negative, negative, with a reaction of acid over acid in TSI, right? Now, enteroinvasive is the one that you need to select when you're being asked these kinds of questions, okay? Now, let's talk about toxins some more. But in this case, it's for enterohemorrhagic E. coli. The other name for the toxin produced by EHEC is the virotoxin. This is derived from viro cells that have been, that have been taken from African green monkey kidney cells, okay? And the toxin is, is, has a similar biochemical structure to Sigella dysenteriae cytotoxin. Okay? It has a similar cytotoxin, cytotoxin um, sorry, has a similar cytotoxin or the biochemical structure is similar to that of the Shigella dysenteriae cytotoxin, which we will discuss in a couple of, in a couple of minutes. Okay? Now, these are your answers to this particular slide. Other name? Virotoxin, where is it derived from? Viro cells. What is, what, what, what's the similar? Which um, we, which cytotoxin or another organism does uh, does it have similarities with, in terms of biochemistry? It's the Shigella dysenteriae cytotoxin. Now let's talk about the serotype uh, associated with EHEC. Please don't forget that. Amongst the other groups of E. coli that we will discuss, this is the most important. This is something that you might encounter even in clinical practice. Actually, we have a specific type of McHonkey for this one, which we'll discuss later, which we'll discuss in a couple of seconds. Now, the serotype that I'm talking about is H70157. H70157. Oh, serotyping. What is H? What is O? I'll leave that to you guys for you to answer, okay? H is what? Is it the capsular or the flagellar antigen or the somatic antigen? What about O? Is it is it somatic? O, uh, is it somatic? Uh, is it the capsular or the flagellar antigen? So when you're typing, when you're serotyping gram-negative bacilli, specifically the, the those who uh, those belonging to the enterobacteria C group, you might you need to be mindful of these things. And the media that we use to this uh, to to detect this particular organism or this particular zero group of the uh, of this particular zero group of E. coli is sorbitol maconchi okay in many cases only sorbitol maconchi will be a non sorbitol from or only uh, only uh, <coughs> only ehec or the enterohemorrhagic E. coli will be the one to produce colorless colonies okay Amongst all five groups that we've discussed, it will be the only non-sorbitol fermenter, okay? It's a non-sorbitol fermenter, so it, therefore it will have colorless colonies, okay? So every uh, if you collect your stool right now, uh, if you don't have an infection of EHEC, we planted it or we've, uh, we, uh, we planted it on sorbitol maconchi, you're going to see it have um, you're going to see it uh, ferment the sorbitol and therefore it will have pink colonies. If it's not, and it's, uh, it's in the H70157 strain, it will produce colorless colonies. So please remember H70157, sorbitol maconchi, colorless colonies, and the only E. coli serotype that has no sorbitol, that is a non-sorbitol uh, fermenter. Okay? Now, Let's talk about EHEC, the disease diseases that may be that may be associated with EHEC. Please don't forget hemorrhea, hemorrhagic colitis, and of course hemolytic uremic syndrome. Okay, now this may be asked in your hematology um, discussions, especially when it comes to bacterial, bacterial, bacteria associated, uh, bacteria associated uremic colitis or uremic syndromes, 
So you're going to see you're going to see a lot of you're going to see a lot of questions associated with this thing, specific, specifically with acquired hemolytic anemia. Okay, so we have what we call acquired hemolytic anemia. So acquired hemolytic anemia can be can be from either blood transfusions or bacterial infections. And if if that's the case, please remember to answer hemolytic uremic syndrome. Okay, and that is associated with E. coli, specifically the EHEC zero group. And yeah. All right, so hemorrhagic colitis, hemolytic uremic syndrome, it's actually the most severe. Now, let's move on to the type of E. coli or the serotype of E. coli that where, where, it is path where its pathogenic mechanism is unknown. Up till now, okay, I've actually just, uh, I've actually just reviewed upon it and I've not found any pathogenic determinants or mechanism. So we got uh, we got enterotoxicogenic E. coli, which basically relies on relies on toxins. Uh, okay, we have also EHEC, which has uh, virotoxin. Other one has the uh, heat lab bile one, or shiga-like shiga -like toxin. This type, this one is not um, it's unknown. So it's enteroaggregative E. coli. All right, so it's enteroaggregative E. coli. Now let's talk about another uh, another similarity between enteroaggregative the tsi result of i'm um, sorry let's talk about uh let's talk about a different group of organisms okay so we're done with e coli and we're going to move on with um oh, sorry i skipped one i skipped one slide um we're going to talk about klebsiella and enterobacter species um we're going to talk about the difference between them okay so both of them have um, have the following results. Um, both of them are invic negative, negative, positive, positive. Both of them are TSI acid over acid plus gas, which means that there is breaking of the culture media because of grass formation. And you need to differentiate the two based on the following, like uh, based on based on motility on ornithine decarboxylase. Okay, ornithine decarboxylase. Okay. Now, for motility, of course, Klebsiella is a is an organism that's non-motile. Therefore, Enterobacter is the enter, uh, Enterobacter is the one that will test positive for motility. Okay. Klebsiella is again negative uh, for ornithine decarboxylase, and both of the tests for both of the tests for motility and decarboxylase, um, Enterobacter uh, Enterobacter will test positive. Okay. Clear. All right. Now let's move on. Um, other names associated with Klebsiella pneumoniae. There's no. It is either two two names that you might you, you must remember. It's Freilander's bacilli, Bacillus mucosus capsularis. Okay, Bacillus mucosus capsularis. The disease uh, that is uh, the disease caused by Klebsiella is is um, highly uh, highly determined by one of the most important pathogenic determinants, which is basically the capsule. Again, it's the term pathogenic determinant capsule. The second the answer to the second bullet is, of course, capsule. Okay? Appearance on culture media, it's usually mucoid colonies that tend to string, to form strings. So it's like when you're um when you're analyzing semen. So um no malice class, right? So when you put an inoculating loop on the colonies, they would form some sort of stringy appearance. Uh, whenever you try to lift them, whenever you try to lift the, the mucoid colonies up with a with an inoculating loop, okay? So it's like it's literally like mucus. Now, please don't forget the names, okay? Friedlander's bacilli, Bacillus mucosus capsularis, okay? Now, the cell species associated with purulent Purulent sinus infections. This is um, Klebsiella ozenae. All right. Purulent sinus infections. And then we have another one. Um, Klebsiella, uh, Klebsiella species associated with granuloma of the nose and the oropharynx. It's Klebsiella rhinoscleromatis. All right. And then another one. How is it different from? How is Klebsiella oxytoca different from the other species? It's the only one that will test indole positive. Remember when you come back to the differentiation of um, E. coli in Enterobacter and Klebsiella, it will test positive with motility, right? So sulfide indole motility, you sim, okay? Whereas indole production, if there's indole production, means that the organism is 
mobile. So so this is the only one that is actually mobile as well. So indoor. Um, it will test for same. It will produce a greenish color. It will produce it will produce a reaction in the same sulfide indole motility. Okay. Now, let's talk about the predominant isolate in the Enterobacter species, which is uh, or the most import. Uh, this is the most predominant isolate or the most uh, associated with disease is, of course, uh, Enterobacter cloacei. Okay, cloacei. Uh, this is the um, the yellow. Uh, the yellow pigment producer, uh, the yellow pigment producer Enterobacter species is, of course, Enterobacter sakazaki. Okay, the pigment intensifies when the when the when incubated at what temperatures? Of course, the at room temperature. Hey, the, um, this is actually very funny. I've encountered this organism in the clinical laboratory for for the for many times now and. They don't produce a lot. They don't produce a lot of um, pigmentation when initially inoculated, uh, especially when you just take it out of the when you take it out of the incubators. You would have almost a non. Um, it's an, it's not a special color of yellow. Uh, the yellow the yellow is basically just like scrambled eggs, but it becomes big bird yellow when you take it out of the when you take it out of the incubator. After several minutes of, after several, uh, sorry, uh, several hours of incubating it at room temperature, the color becomes intensely yellow. Okay, so from a dull yellow, it becomes like a, a big bird's feathers. Okay, so just remember Enterobacter um, Sakazaki. Okay, so yellow pigment producing um, uh, species of Enterobacter is Enterobacter Sakazaki. Um, a key notable feature of this one, uh, traditionally, traditionally, is that it's one of the members that would test that would pig that would that would intensify its pigment producing abilities when when incubated at 25 degrees Celsius. Now, increased urease activity is in one of, is is one of the characteristics uh, of what Enterobacter species. It's actually Gergovia, okay? Enterobacter Gergovia increased urease activity so it's a fa it's it's fast acting when it comes to urease act uh, when it comes to urease production but obviously m many of the times when you look at your when you look at your um gram negative uh gram negative bacilli or enterobacteriaceae enterobacteriaceae uh, algorithm of identification for traditional biochemical testing uh, this particular one doesn't have any. This particular slide doesn't have any bearing, because urease activity is something that obviously points to members, certain members of Enterobacter and family, including Enterobacter. But when it comes to increased urease activity, um, we want to uh, we want to let you guys know that. When you're being tested in the exams, it's not going to ask you which of the following will have the fastest reaction to urease. That's 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 a little um that's a little too straight. That's a little too difficult, it's even for even for people who've been studying microbiology for a long time. Obviously, you're not going to be asked about the the speed of activity, the speed of urease activity, or the rate of urease activity between species. But this is just a little bit of nugget. Uh, a little a little nugget of um of fact factoids little factoids for you guys to remember okay now let's move on to um differentiate the differentiation of or, or several organisms now pan please remember that pantoea will come into will come into light in this particular um in this particular discussion because we're going to discuss Four organisms from uh, from both Klebsiella and Enterobacter plus Pantoea agglomerans. So this is the first, uh, maybe the first and the last time we're going to discuss Pantoea. So please don't forget the, the please don't forget that they belong to the uh, they belong to the Enterobacter family. I don't know where else to where else to put this um uh this organism so i just opted to put it with the other organisms that requires the following test so please don't forget uh to arrange them in this particular way okay 
um, for Amanda, who's who always asks me of ways to memorize certain uh, certain patterns. This is something that you might be interested in. Kapeko. 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 Klebsiella pneumoniae and Klebsiella oxytoca. Ero ek. I don't know. Um, ero ek. And pak. Pak. Diba? Right? Alright, so I don't know. Um, I usually just uh, remember K P K O E A E C and P A. So that's my I don't know that uh, make a make some sort of mnemonic for this one, but make it make sure that you arrange it this way. Alright, I I don't know, but what well, the thing that you need to remember when you're differentiating these four organisms is. Um, lysine decarboxylase, de ornithine decarboxylase, and arginine dehydrogenase. Why? Because these three, th three tests will test positive on uh, these three tests will, will uh, sorry, all of this, all of these organisms will test positive for la um, lysine decarboxylase or LDC, except for Enterobacter cloacea and Pantuae agglomerans. Okay? And or nothing decarboxylase, which has positive for aerogen for both for all species of Enterobacter, except for the other two organisms that we're going to discuss. And for arginine dehydrogenase, Enterobacter cloacea will be the only one that will test positive. Okay, so it's easy to remember, right? All will test positive with lysine decarboxylase. All except all, all except um everyone will uh all will test negative or ornithine decarboxylase except for enterobacter species. And all will test negative except for enterobacter cloacea when it comes to ADH or arginine dehydrogenase. Okay? Now, we're going to talk about serratia species. Now, obviously, what, you're going to go, what you guys are going to remember is that serratia is the, co the organism that would, color, that would produce a red pigment. But there's only one organism that produces that one and that is that is ratio uh, sorry there's two organisms rather not one um i just added this a couple of uh, a couple of um a couple of discussions ago probably two years ago so that i've still i've, I've, I've always still um i've always remembered it only as serratia mar marcescens but now we have two organisms we've updated the list so there's two red pigment producing colonies of serratia marcescens Okay, uh, oh, sorry, of serratia species, um, serratia marcescens and serratia rubidea. Okay, and the name of the pigment is known as prodigioc. Okay, now, notable biochemical characteristics of serratia species is that they test positive for the following DNAs, gelatinase, and lipase. Remember DNAs? Okay, staph aureus they tests positive with DNAs. Remember? Color, color indicator is methyl red. So you guys, so you guys might have forgotten. Okay, okay. Now we also have uh, we also have another one, um, Serratia odorifera. All right, Serratia odorifera, and it produces a characteristic rancid potato-like odor. It's like a rotting potato. Okay, like French fries when when you've been standing for um, for almost a month. On, in your lockers when you're <laughs> when you when you I don't know I don't like eating french fries anyway but yeah so it has that rancid potato like odor so odorifera from the name itself you can you can you can deduce that it's um it's an organism that is uh that produces a rancid maybe I'll give you guys a case about this for example it's a, it's a gram negative organism that is associated that grows red uh, that the the Test positive for DNAs and DNAs, gelatinase, and lipase with a characteristic potato, potato, um, with a characteristic rancid potato like odor. So, see, you might encounter these types of questions. Okay, now, um, let's go into in depth with um, serratia species. A serratia species can be tested with orgenine or, uh, sorry, ornithine decarboxylase and arabinose test. Okay, so Arabinose test. Um, it actually has. Um, you only need to remember the three organisms. Okay, you only need to remember these three organisms when you're biochemical when you're testing for serratia. 
and usually it's serratia marcescens, liquefactions, and rubidea. Okay, so I added again rubidea at the end. Um, in my previous lectures, it was just it was just serratia marcescens and liquefactions, and now I'm adding rubidea because it has a different biochemical characteristic. Now, who tests positive for ODC? Everybody tests positive except for rubidea. For arabinose fermentation, it's everybody except for liquefactions. Ah, sorry, um, marcescence. So ODC positive would be serratia marcescence and serratia liquefactions. Arabinose fermentation is serratia liquefactions and serratia rubidea. Okay, it's really quite easy to remember. It's like a Tetris. Uh, it's, it's like a Tetris brick. If you look at it, if you look at it clearly, right? It's like I, I'm not sure if you guys know what Tetris is, but it's a block game, and if it looks like a lightning bolt, most probably that's Eurasia. That those are the, the um. That is my that's my mnemonic. As long as you remember how to put it properly or in order, in this case, you can add a lightning bolt on it. Okay, now. Serratia species is a common nosocomial infection associated with what? There's three diseases. Uh, there's three um, clinical conditions that may be associated with serratia or uh, with the serratia species. It's 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 usually endocarditis, pneumonia, and bacteremia. Um, in most cases, especially for um, for ICU patients, I've encountered it in cases of pneumonia as well as in bacteremia. I've not really seen endocarditis um, uh, in some of the organisms, in some of my, in some of the organisms um, that we've grown in the clinical lab. Usually it's this one, usually. Because I have, um, probably because I haven't worked in a, in a heart specialty hospital, so that's the reason why I might not have been encountered it. But majority of the time it's pneumonia, um, if in severe cases of in severe cases it comes as uh, it comes out as bacteremia, okay. Now let's move on to Salmonella species, okay. Now um, probably in this particular discussion, aside from E. coli, Salmonella is one of the things that you might consider learning also, okay. Why? Because it's associated with foodborne organism. It's a foodborne. Uh, it's a foodborne disease-causing organism. It has a lot of. Uh, it has a lot of questions that may be, that may be taken by examiners, and they could play around with the biochemicals as well as the morphological characteristics of Salmonella. So please, 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 please be mindful when you're studying your gram-negative organisms. Okay. Now let's start with the. Uh, let's start with the disease associated with Salmonella. So it's associated with enteritis, systemic infections, or um, bacteremia or septicemia, um, and enteric fever. What do you mean by enteric fever? So enteritis, obviously, you know this as probably uh, diarrhea with bloody stools, or um, yeah, blood, diarrhea with bloody stools, vomiting, etc., etc. Um, enteric fever is quite different. Uh, it's a fever that you might get. When you're when you've ingested something that is a negative, uh, it's a gram-negative organism that's family Salmonella, and um, high high-grade fever uh, with rosy spots in the abdomen. Okay, and we'll talk about those rosy spots in the abdomen, but first we need to talk about a species of Salmonella. Okay, so there's the Kaufman White scheme. Okay, so similar to similar to Streptococcus, they have different different um, grouping mechanisms or grouping schemes. So the Kaufman White scheme differentiates a Salmonella species, or sorry, speciates Salmonella into four organisms: Salmonella typhi, Salmonella cholera suis, Salmonella typhimurium, and Salmonella dervi. Now, when we go to another one, which is Ewing classification, or the Ew classification. You have Salmonella typhi, Salmonella cholera suis. Now this time, you have Salmonella enteritidis cirovar typhumurium and Salmonella enteritidis cirovar derby. Okay? So please don't forget these two types of um, um, classification or, or schemes or, or speciation schemes. I call it speciation. Now, let's move on to um, the motility characteristics of the Salmonella species. Okay, all species of Salmonella are considered motile except for Salmonella gallinarum and Salmonella pleurum. Okay, Salmonella gallinarum and Salmonella pleurum. They have the characteristic. Uh, they have different. They have. They have a. 
specific characteristics, uh, specific biochemical characteristics that can be detected. Oh, maybe this is salmonella, but you get confused. Why? Because it's non motile. But I thought everybody was motile. Every every organisms inclu in, that include that is included in the salmonella species uh, in salmonella species are motile. Well, there are two. Okay, there is. There is Salmonella gallinarum and Salmonella pulorum. How they, how they, how are they still members of the mem uh, family Salmonella? Well, as I mentioned before, you need to perform 16s, 16s RNA um, genotyping, and usually they belong to this group, and they have not been reclassified primarily because they have similar genetic, um, similar genetic makeup. Okay, so yeah. Now, let's move on to Gartner's bacilli. Gartner's bacilli refers to what E-wing classification of Salmonella. So our choices are as follows. E-wing. Salmonella typhimurium, Salmonella cholera suis, Salmonella enteritidis, and Salmonella typhimurium. So in this case, you might be confused. Maybe it's Salmonella typhi because this is the one that we usually discuss in, in, cl in, the, clinical lab, in the clinical lab. But actually, it's a, it's a trick question. Look at the difference between the two. There's no var or zero type enteritidis. There is no zero. Uh, there is no enteritidis class. Okay, when it comes to the Kaufman-White scheme, but for even classification, obviously it's enteritidis. Enteritidis is added, but there are two types: zero type amorium and zero derby, zero var derby, right? Now, that's the reason why I consider this a tip question because you can remove the other two organisms. By just realizing that, oh, it's the Ewing classification. So probably discuss it has something to do with entering this with the entry to these subgroups. Right? So now you can select which of the two. So you have a 50-50% chance of selecting the correct answer, right? And actually the correct answer is Salmonella entry to this zero var derby. Okay? So yeah, Gartner's bacilli. Please don't forget Gartner's bacilli. Now Salmonella species, species associated with bacteremia, of course. This is called Salmonella cholera suis. Salmonella species associated with enterocolitis and gastroenteritis is Salmonella typhimurium. Okay, typhimurium. Okay, gastroenteritis, uh, bacteremia, so cholera suis, gastroenteritis, and er slash enterocolitis includes Salmonella typhimurium. Okay, now let's move on to zero groups associated with enteric fever. All right, Salmonella zero groups. So zero groups are different. Okay, so we have to talk about Paratyphi A and Paratyphi B in this case, and of course Cholera suis and Salmonella typhi. Okay, the most common one that's associated with enteric fever is Salmonella typhi. Okay, actually enteric fever is also known as typhoid fever. All right, now we have other terms for Paratyphi organisms. All right, so we have Paratyphi B and Paratyphi C. For paratyphi B and C, it's known as Salmonella schlot, schlot Merli. Okay, schlot Mulleri, sorry. And then par, par, for paratyphi C is Hirschfeldi. Okay, Hirschfeldi. Okay. Now again, names are associated with the scientists who discovered these organisms. Okay, maybe in the future you might be considered, you might be considered as um, a person, a founder of a specific specific species of organisms and you might see um, i don't know um salmonella salmonella segi i don't know anyway let's move on to our next organism other terms associated with enteric fever so I, as i mentioned before this is also known as the as typhoid fever and the clinical feature of um of typhoid fever is of course fever all right and rosy spots or rose spots in the abdomen. Okay, so it's that's the reason why a lot of physicians, especially in the Philippines, um, uh, during the rainy seasons, they look at the abdomen of children. This maybe they have ingested something where there's salmonella, or they might have eaten something with salmonella typhoid, with salmonella typhi. So they're trying to rule out typhoid fever, of course. So they look at the rose spots. It's pathognomonic for typhoid fever, especially in the early stages of the disease. Now, let's look at this in terms of, um, of our clinical practice. 
most of the time physicians will request um will request blood in the first week and then after two weeks they will request stool okay for stool culture and then um on the third week serum or serological testing is usually done on patients okay so serological testing so blood for what blood culture okay Next is for the second week is for soul culture and the third week is for serology. Okay, so this is something that is commonly asked in the board exam. So please don't forget this. Okay. So, so in the, the uh, so again, this might be altered in my exam. So patient has presented the key features of salmonello salmonellosis, specifically typhoid fever. Um, it has been it has been. 27 days since the first onset of fever and rosy uh, and rosy uh, key key diagnostic tests rather that might be asked in your microbiology exam so please don't focus on don't just focus on oh okay i'm going to take serology today i'm going to take serology exams today and i'm just going to focus on what we discussed in serology and then there and then in microbiology you do the same thing but then they ask you a question about serology right there are certain uh, there are certain professors that there's a, there are certain professors when I was in school that would ask us about serial serial dilution in microbiology because these two things are interrelated. Actually, the whole clinical microbiology practice is, is a holistic approach. It does not um, it does not necessarily mean that one one subject a subject area or subject matter will only be related to your exam. And then that's the only thing that we're going to ask. Okay, so everything is interrelated. So as I mentioned before, you have HUS or hemolytic uremic syndrome. Hemolytic uremic syndrome. Now, it might be a question in hematology. It might be a question in bacteriology. So we never know. All right. That's why I want you guys to come into your exams understanding that each question can be each each topic may be related to a topic from a different subject okay so please put that in your please put let that marinate in your noggin now what is the serological test for typhoid fever obviously we're, we we would still not forget about the uh, the very popular and the very um, the very classic Weidel test okay Weidel test Weidel test doesn't matter how you pronounce it as long as you select the correct uh, the correct choice in your exams All right now let's talk about the antigen since we're already doing so we're already doing um we're already doing uh, what do you call this Weidel test let's talk about the antigens present in salmonella OHK obviously i've discussed this in our previous uh, in our previous um pres uh, slideshow presentation um, I'm just going to reiterate it again for you guys so you don't get you, so you don't forget O antigen, H antigen and K antigen. O antigen stands for fill in the blanks, okay? H antigen stands for fill in the blanks. We're going to answer that later. K antigen stands for fill in the blanks. So these are these are your answers. O antigen is somatic antigen. So please don't forget among the three choices it's the only one with O. So somatic antigen, H antigen is the flagellar antigen, K antigen is the capsular antigen. So please don't forget these things. Now, differentiate O antigen and H antigen based on stability. I mentioned this before. The flagella is heat labile because its major majority of its biochemical structure is protein is protein based, while the O antigen is a lipid bilayer and can survive higher higher temperatures. Therefore. O antigen is the heat stable and the H antigen is heat labile. All right. Now, another thing that you need to take into consideration is the VI antigen. The VI antigen is found in the in which of the following antigenic structures? So you have three choices. So it's the only one that we didn't discuss, therefore it's the K antigen or the what? The capsular antigen. It's actually responsible for the invasiveness of the organism. Okay? Um, it's possible for the, it's a um, uh, it's the reason why you get those rosy spots because it allows the organism to travel about the um, the mesenterium or the mesenteric uh, the mesenteric cavity of your of your patient. Okay, now 
um, uh, tighter values uh, since we're doing um, serological testing or vital testing. So please don't forget that an active infection will test will have will have a tighter will have, will have an O antigen tighter of greater than of greater than one is to six one sixty. Immunization is an H antigen titer of 1 is to 160. And a carrier state is VI antigen. What is VI antigen again? It's a capsular antigen. Okay? It's a capsular antigen. So carrier state. So it might, maybe the patient uh, doesn't have the clinical symptomology for salmonellosis or typhoid fever. But when you test the serology, uh, the titers of... Um, of all antigens there is an increase in the k antigen or the vi antigen of the organism or of the patient so maybe hmm. okay so again this is something that you need to take into consideration when you are when you are answering typhoid related questions either in serology or in microbiology so i might ask a question about this okay? i might I might i might now how many samples are obtained in we in Weedle testing? Ideally, it's two samples in a seven to ten day interval. Okay, depending on the institution, of course, and the policy and procedures in the institution. But in most cases, it's around. It's usually around ten. It, it, the diagnosis will. Uh, the diagnosis and the management of salmonellosis, if the if it's not a complicated case, it's around seven to ten days. Okay, there's two sample collected, first uh, first entry, and then probably on the seventh day or the last day of the uh, last day of of admission. Why is it important to do this? To prove that there is an actual rise in the antibody titers of the organism, right? Because we're not relying on because we're not relying on growth of organisms. We're relying on the patient's response or anamnestic response to the microorganism. If you don't have if you don't have an anamnestic response, then it's probably a different organism, right? If you tested it with Weidel test, hmm, maybe the organism doesn't maybe the organism doesn't exist in the patient's body, and then we misdiagnose the patient as Salmonella, and it could be a different disease. That's why we want to prove that there is an actual rise in the antibody titers. Let's remember, as we move along our discussion, there are some organisms that have similar case presentations or similar morphological characteristics in biochemistry or morphological or colonial morphology okay so please be mindful of this okay now black colonies of salmonella typhi is observed in what culture media of course you have bismuth sulfate uh, bismuth sulfide um, agar and uh, and silos dextrose lactose actually the best culture media um, according to many of the books that I've read, the preferable, they said it's preferable, it's the best. It's actually bismuth sulfide agar. It's the best for isolation of salmonella typhi colonies. Which is the best for the isolation of salmonella typhi? Okay? So that's the answer. Bismuth sulfide agar, or BSA. Silos dextrose lactose, XLD, is good for the isolation of other microorganisms, um, other enteric organisms like Shigella and Citrobacter. But Bismuth sulfide is the best for Salmonella typhi. In general, uh, for general um, general enteric pathogens, silos uh, dextrose, silos dextrose lactose or XLD is the best one. Now let's talk about the IVIC results. Okay, so Salmonella typhi is different from the other uh, members of its uh, of its genera because Salmonella typhi will test negative, positive, negative, negative for IVIC. And for salmonella, for other salmonella species, with this positive, negative, positive, negative. Okay. So see, see why we want to discuss the Invic results because it's important for you guys. All right. Now, let's talk about the other name for salmonella typhi. It's known as Eberth's bacilli. Eberth's bacilli, or Eberth's bacilli. Okay. That's basically it for our discussion about salmonella typhi most of the questions that you will be asked about salmonella are in form in in a form of case presentation or you could see you could see a lot of questions related to it when it comes uh, test test related um, diagnostic tests also you gotta remember these things now let's move on to another organism which is shigella 
Salmonella shigella agar, right? So if you guys remember, it's SSA, Salmonella shigella agar. Usually, I would combine these two organisms in my discussions because I don't want my students to get confused with um, with two organisms. They all they both cause similar uh, symptomologies, but what's different with shigella is the following. Okay, the natural habitat of shigella species is limited to what part of the human body? It's only in the intestinal tract. Okay, so most of the time it will cause enteric diseases, enterocolitis, um, would cause a gastritis or to, to to some extent, but majority of the time it's mostly related to intestinal infections. Okay, now there are four zero groups of um, four zero groups of Shigella, and indicate the following um, when it comes to medically important species. So for group A, we talk about Shigella dysenteriae. For group B, we have flexneri. For group C, it's boidi. We go with A, B, C, D. Okay, A, B, C, D. And we need to do, we need to use three tests. It's um, catalase, ONPG, or ornithine, or ornithine. Ornith um, yeah, ONPG, ortonitophenyl glucosidine. Okay, and lastly is your mannitol fermentation. Mannitol fermentation is important because if you grew organisms in MSA, need to do mannitol fermentation because enteric microorganisms will and the only enteric microorganism that would test positive with um, mannitol fermentation is is Shigella okay now let's talk about the let's talk about them one by one all of them will test positive for catalase except for Shigella dysenteriae okay all of them will test positive will test negative for ONPG or ortonitophenyl glucosidase except for Shigella sunae which is a late fermenter okay so be mindful mannitol fermentation first then go to catalase if it's positive it might be one of these three organisms and if it's negative it's probably Shigella dysenteriae okay if it's OEPG negative it's probably one of the three and if it's a late fermenter it's probably sunae now Let's move on to the next uh, the next topic, which is the pathogenic determinants of Shigella dysenteriae. There are two toxins that are released by Shigella dysenteriae. It's exotoxins and endotoxins. Now, and now the description of the following are as follows: the exotoxins are released during intestinal colonization, while the endotoxins are responsible for the bowel irritation. So. More or less, when the organism becomes invasive and it settles in your gut or your GI tract, uh, your GIT tract, the exotoxins will be released. But when you're still when you're when you just ingested the organism and they're starting to and they're starting to die off in your bowel, that's probably the cause the the one that causes bowel irritation will probably be from the exo endotoxin. Okay. So it's an organism that produces both endo and exotoxin. Now, appropriate specimens for Shigella, it's actually stool and rectal swabs. Okay, stool and rectal swabs. Okay, what's the difference between a stool and rectal swab? Um, actually, the processing is quite different. It is quite similar, but the other one is in the form of um the other one the reason why rectal swab is um is important because 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 you gotta be able to isolate the organ. actually in some in some clinical books or in some medical microbiology books shigella may be isolated in um shigella may be isolated uh she get the primary diagnosis of shigella is actually done through um rectal swabs Okay, patient is suffering. So basically, you would see case presentations like these. Patient is suffering from, patient is suffering from um, hematochesia with a freshly voided stool, in freshly voided stools. What are these stools? There's small, so, so, slow growths in a small late lactose fermentation growth in, in XLD. Okay, and uh, non-sulfide producer. It's a non-sulfide producer. And lastly, is that it's negative for most of the tests in either IMVIC and TSI. Okay, and then next question would be, what's the most ideal? What's the most ideal 
um, if the physician is if the physician is considering Shigella, which of the following specimens will be most appropriate aside from stool samples? So again, so see how they would how examiners may be able to play around with the data that is being presented to you. Okay, now invic invic reaction for Shigella dysenteriae. It's going to be variable, positive, negative, negative. So again, again, why is what why is variable indicated there? Because sometimes it has different reactions to this one, to the indole, and that's the reason why it's not enough to test it. It's not enough to test it with just invic. You have to go to you have to go to a lot of biochemical testing first. Okay. Now, what other names are associated with the following? So please don't forget. Um, so please don't forget, Shiga bacilli is dysenteria. Flexneri, when someone is flexing, means that they're strong. All right, Boydi is Boyd's bacilli, and Sone is Son Duval bacilli. Right, so see, I have a, I have a, I have a, a brief, uh, I have a brief illustration for Amanda. Okay, so dysenteria is something that you need to remember. Um, our type species, the organism that you might be encountering in the exams most of the time, will probably be the Shiga bacilli. All right, so flexneri is strong bacilli. When you're flexing, you are strong. You're, you're, when you're flexing your muscles, you're showing your strength. Okay, boys bacilli is boy D. Okay, so ne is son duval. So, so nomenclature wise, the other, the latter half is easy to remember. Right now. Let's move on to the classification of Shigella species based on, um, based on what particular antigen or the basis of the classification of Shigella species based on the somatic antigen or the O antigen, okay? And one antigen is produced only by Shiga bacilli. What is Shiga bacilli? It's Shigella dysenteriae. And the antigen that they produce is the A antigen. So please don't forget, the answer to this slide is the A antigen. I created an illustration for you guys okay i created an illustration for you guys so you guys don't remember so you guys don't forget okay a antigen sd what's sd shigella dysenteriae now we're going to move on with another set of organisms this is proteus and why is there a drawing sir there's p and there's m this is proteus this is proteus providentia and morganella so please don't forget that when I'm discussing proteus species, I want to include Providentia and Morganella. Okay? So let's move on. Let's discuss proteus. Now, proteus, um, in this case, um, the characteristic uh, proteus species, uh, the characteristic of proteus species to produce a translucent sheath in culture media is known as swarming phenomenon. Okay. Among all the organisms that you might be annoyed when you're working in the clinical laboratory, Proteus is one of them because it interferes with the identification of other organisms because it produces a translucent sheet in the culture media. Okay, so this is our this is my drawing for it. So your initial inoculum is starting uh, starts here, 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 but the growth of the organism will ray, will will expand from the outer edges of your initial inoculum so please don't don't expect that you will only grow organisms on where you streaked it in cases of swarming phenomenon you will see it in the whole culture media much like that this much like this drawing that you see here okay now what substances are incorporated in culture media to prevent swarming phenomenon you can use sodium um, sodium azide phenyl uh, phenyl ethyl alcohol or citrate hydrate, uh, sorry, chlora, uh, chloral hydrate. We have, um, we actually use clean media when we want to, uh, when we want to prevent swarming phenomenon because it has phenyl, uh, phenyl ethyl alcohol or P. Okay, so you have three substances. Okay, sodium azide. Okay, sodium azide, phenyl ethyl alcohol, and chloral hydrate. Okay, please don't forget these three things so clean media is uh, clean media has phenyl, phenyl ethyl alcohol which can be used for chlor uh, for urine and again i wrote it here for you guys this is actually a, a slide that i used for my free previous discussion with my other students but yeah whatever okay now we have what you call danes phenomenon now danes phenomenon is when two different strains of proteus species are inoculated in the same culture media they would form a demarcation line 
So let's say, for example, you have two strains of um, two strains of yeah, that's known as Dane's phenomenon. And they will form a demarcation line. So, for example, both of these organisms are protea species. Okay, and one side of the much like in many laboratories right now, they save culture media, so they use half of the culture media and for one specimen, and the other specimen has another specimen from another patient. So that's that's really the case in some hospitals. I've experienced it mostly in the Philippines. But yeah, um, when you inoculate the organ, when you inoculate the specimen on one side and on and another specimen on the other side, then then these organisms are two different strains of Proteus species. They would form a demarcation line. They they would repel each other. Basically, that's what Dane phenomenon is. It's repelling the organisms. It's like they are having a war with each other. All right now. What particular antigen is used for serological testing when it comes to when it comes to Proteus? So Proteus is actually used in serological testing, and O antigen is used. Okay, O antigen is used. Okay, now the organism, the Proteus, is, Proteus species are actually important because they are used in a in a specific serological test, which is known as Will Felix. Okay, the test is used for the diagnosis of what disease? The reason why I put a big yellow circle there is because I want you guys to remember the Ketzial infections. Because I'm not going to discuss Ketzial infections in bacteriology, okay? So we're going to the last thing that we're going to discuss in bacteriology is not actually Ketzia and Chlamydia. We're going to discuss um, automation. So I want you guys. This may be the first and last time that we are, we're going to discuss about zero um, Will Felix. And I want you guys to remember that you use organism, the test organism that you use, and the antigen that comes, and uh, the antigen that we want to benefit, uh, the antigen that we want to derive benefit from is actually the O antigen of Proteus species. Because it's for important in well Felix tests, and it's a serological test for rickettsial infections. All right. Now, the antigens used for well Felix is actually from two different organisms, OX and OX1. OX1 and OX2 comes from somatic antigens of Proteus vulgaris, and OXK comes from Proteus mirabilis. Okay. So you have two types of um, organisms when you're doing Will Felix, okay? It's OX, OX19 and OX2, all right? OXK from Proteus mirabilis, okay? So we're, when, you're, when you're doing that one, what's the importance? Because we want to speciate the organi the Rickettsial organisms, and we're not going to discuss this one. It's a big topic. It's going to take you take us one hour or more just to differentiate the different um, Rickettsial species. And usually it's not tested in the exams, so I'm not going to delve deep into that one. I right? want you guys to understand key topics that may be tested in the exams, okay? Now, Proteus, um, because Proteus species can produce an alkaline environment, they have been associated with the formation of urinary calculi and or stones, okay? Why? Because um, because these are organisms that may be associated with UTI. Also, they tend to make the they tend to make a certain solution alkaline, and therefore, when something is alkaline, it becomes uh, it forms crystals, right? Or it, it, it precipitates salts. Okay, so urinary calculi calculi uh, could be one of the culprits for urinary calculi or stones is actually um, Proteus species. Now, IMVIC results. We're going to see a lot of variables in the in the ensuing in the ensuing slide. Proteus vulgaris is actually positive positive negative variable. Okay. Proteus mirabilis is negative positive variable variable. Okay? So it's very hard to identify them, right? Actually in the clinical laboratory, I already know that it's Proteus it's a Proteus species when I see swarming. Yes, that's correct. When you see swarming, okay. So we have a psychic connection. I already know what you guys are about to say. All right. Now, which species of Proteus is capable of swarming in blood agar plates? It's actually Proteus mirabilis. Actually, ninety-five percent of the time, it's actually Proteus mirabilis who would swarm on blood agar plates. But I think right now, um, um, yeah, 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 Proteus mirabilis. Yeah. 
even in my clinical practice i've seen this all the time how would species uh, how would the following species be identified you use indole test okay indole proteus venabilis will test positive i uh, sorry proteus vulgaris will test positive whilst proteus mirabilis will test negative so look at the look back at our discussion so see imvic from the imvic result the first uh, the first signs here proteus vulgaris will test positive or proteus mirabilis tests negative let's go back is it the correct one yeah see 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 the importance of imvic of memorizing the imvic results of the organisms i cannot stress it enough for you guys you must be able to come to your exams with a little bit of knowledge about the imbic results of certain organisms. Now, the production of ga what gas is the reason why protein species may be identified from other members of the Enterobacteria C family. The production of hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide. Okay, the production of hydrogen sulfide. What test may be used to identify the gas producing organisms of protein uh, species? Well, it's either urease test or phenylalanine deaminase test or PDA test used to differentiate it from other S H2S producing organisms who are the other, who's, which other H, H2S microorganism am I talking about it's actually salmonella okay bismuth sulfide agar it will test positive for both phenylalanine deaminase and urease test most of the time P yeah. P P PDT or PDA phenylalanine deaminase the aminase and then urease. Now let's talk about Citrobacter and Arizona species. Citrobacter and Arizona species are bacterial genera that are closely related to which bacteria or what bacterial organism or family. It's actually Salmonella species. All right. Now, um, what bacteria is morphologically similar to Citrobacter? It's E. coli, morphology-wise. For biochemical, uh, biochemical, in the biochemical perspective, it's actually Salmonella typhi. Okay, when we're talking about morphology, the organisms may be similar to E. coli. When it comes to biochemistry, Salmonella typhi. All right. Now, tests that may be used to differentiate Salmonella from Citrobacter, it's urea, it's either it's urease test and growth on KCN agar, potassium cyanide agar. Okay, the only one that grows in potassium cyanide and it will test positive for urease as well, while Salmonella will test negative for urease. All right, now invic results are as follows: negative, positive, negative, negative. So memorize pa parin ba siya? Actually, hindi na. Oh, sorry, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. See, actually, hindi ko na siya memorize. I don't have, I don't have, clear, I don't have an eidetic memory, so I don't. I don't remember the invic, but uh, the invic results of the organisms. But I want why, why I want you guys to remember this is because at least you can extrapolate a little bit of data or a little bit of understanding, right? In our previous discussion, in the general discussions of gram-negative organisms, I discussed to you guys the importance of uh, the um, of biochemical testing, right? There's some, there's some key principles that you might find interesting and you might correlate with. Um, with clinical uh, clinical case presentations in your exams, so be mindful of those things. That's why I want I can't stress it enough. Please remember your invic results. Okay. Now let's talk about Arizona Hinshawi. This is not Sharon Conetta. It's not related to Sharon Conetta, but is an accidental pathogen to man, but is usually infectious to birds and reptiles. Okay. So who are the organisms? Uh, who are the people at risk for contracting infections associated to Arizona? People who handle animals, right? Like what? Zookeepers, veterinarians, or veterinary technicians. Okay? Now, visualization of what sugar is unique to Arizona Hinshawi? It's actually malonate. Okay? Uh, malonate utilization results to what pH uh, media? Uh, malonate utilization turns the turns the alkali turns the media alkaline. It's actually uh, it's actually an acidic, an acidic um uh, it's, it's an acidic media agar based media, and um a solid media sorry 
and then color indication is the color indicator is bromothymol blue the positive result is of course blue it's like citrate simon citrate agar okay now invic result of arizona in shao is negative positive negative positive okay negative positive negative positive and of course we're going to talk about edward sila since we're already in the citrobacter family we want to talk about something related to Citrobacter, which is actually Cit uh, Edward, C Edward Sila, okay? Or Edward Siela. So Edward Siela is again associated with animals, um, reptiles, freshwater fish, aquarium fish, frogs, and turtles. Again, pet handlers or animal, um, people who handle animals, okay? Species of Edward Sheila as usually is usually isolated from uh, isolated from what man? What man? What do you mean man? from man? It's supposed to be from man, not what man. So remove this one. Um, species of Edward Sheila that maybe that are usually isolated from man is, of course, Edward Sheila tarda or Edward Sheila tarda. Edward Sheila tarda. Okay. Conditions that may be associated with this microorganism is septicemia, meningitis, and wound infections. Most important, uh, most of the time, it's around it's wound infections. Very rarely do you, do you see meningitis and septicemia in your case presentations. Why? Why wound infections? In case presentations, they might uh, they might ask you a pet handler who has been recently bit by a by an alligator in in the zoo. Or yeah, so you might get you might get case presentations like these. That's why I'm I'm. I'm, I'm giving you guys information already this, this much information now I mentioned earlier Providentia and Morganella okay Providentia and Morganella is close related to um, the Proteus species but we're going to discuss it here a specific uh, slideshow for them here Providentia and Morganella are closely related to Proteus they the only how are they biochemically different the both or both organisms do not produce hydrogen sulfide unlike proteus okay so unlike proteus providentia and morganella don't have h2s they don't have that black tinge in the tsi media all right now medical conditions associated with the following organisms providentia retgeri and morganella morgani these are the type of organisms that you need to remember Right, so Providentia is associated with UTIs, okay, urinary tract infections. And Morganella morgani is mostly associated or isolated from nosocomial infections, okay? Nosocomial infections. I want you guys to not forget about these two organisms because you might encounter this in your exams, okay? Now, invic results of the following. I added an extra one. Um, all of them are actually negative. Um, uh where is the slide what happened to the slide oh this is the slide yeah so providentia is positive positive negative positive um providentia uh providentia stuarty is positive positive negative positive why did i ask stuarty sometimes you might get it okay how do i differentiate providentia red gary and providentia red uh stuarty actually there is um there is there isn't any um biochemical manual biochemical test that you can do but there is um dna probes Okay. Morganella morgani can be differentiated uh, by negative uh, citrate utilization. So it's positive, positive, negative, negative. See? Positive, positive, negative, positive, 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 negative, positive, 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 negative, negative. See? Easy, right? Another organism that you might encounter in your exams is Yersinia. Yersinia species. Okay? Another one. And another one. Okay? So. What is the uh, other term for Yersinia pestis? It's known as the plague bacillus. The staining characteristic of this organism is a safety fin bacillus. The, uh, the stain that we use to observe the safety fin bacillus is using wasen stain. Okay? Wasen stain. Okay? Other name, plague bacilli. Safety fin bacilli is the appearance when stained using wasen stains. Okay? Now, Let's move on to the antigens. Antigen, we have B and the W antigen. Okay, your senia pestis is less susceptible for intracellular killing because of the following antigens. Where are these antigens found? They are found in the in the in the cell wall. Very good. 
Okay, now, what type of toxin is released by Yersinia pestis? It's an exotoxin. An other name for this um, toxin is known as pesticin or bacterio bacteriosin. Sorry, Bacter I was about, to, about I was about to say bacteriolysin, but it's actually bacteriosin. Okay, so you, um, it's an exotoxin, and the name, the specific name for it, is either pesticin or bacteriosin. Now we have enzymes that are important to Yersinia pestis. It's coagulase and isocitrate lyase. Okay. Isocitrate lyase. And there are two type there are three types of plague, of course. Please don't please don't forget your bubonic plague, pneumonic plague, and septicemic plague. How do we identify if somebody has bubonic plague? If the patient has bubosis. It's like those um it's like bumps and uh, it's not really a malignant bump, but rather a bump that has um that has a what do you call this? Uh, black fluid. You might uh you might be able to aspirate black fluid from these, from the from these buboses. We call it buboses. Okay, pneumonic plague. Um, basically, you're you're vomiting or you have, you're suffering from hemoptysis. Okay, you're coughing up blood. Septicemic plague is of course the last stage, of uh, it's basically the last stage of the plague, of getting of you suffering from plague. Okay, so it's an overall uh, uh, multi. Uh, it affects multiple organs in the body. Okay, now mode of transmission of Yersinia pestis is actually a zoonosis. Okay, a vector bite from a vector known as a Xenopsilia chiopis. What is Xenopsilia chiopis? It's actually just ticks. Okay, garapata. Okay, fleas. Now, black death is termed associated with plague. Uh, the black the black death is the term associated with plague bacillus. This is characterized by what clinical picture? Black uh, black purpuric spots. So black purpuric spots. What is purpura? Um, you're going to see it in uh, you're going to see it in cases where there's where there's failure for blood clotting, specifically with platelets. So when there's purpura, uh, usually it's red. It's like an ecchymosis. Um, it's like um, when you got pat when when you, you if you guys see videos in the in television where somebody got paddled uh, for initiation for initiations in in fraternities, uh, that what that's what it looks like, uh, but make it blacker, turn ter, uh, turn the um, uh, imagine it uh, uh, imagine it black. Okay, this is known as Schwarzman phenomenon. Not Schwartz phenomenon, Schwartzman phenomenon. So black purpuric spots. Okay, so black purpuric spots. Now, broth culture media exhibit what phenomenon? This is known as the stalactite formation. So um, also known as stalactite streamers. Okay. The stalactite formation when you when you culture it in broth media. Okay. And we have red colored colonies of your senior pestis is observed in Deoxycholate, deoxycholate agar or DCA. Okay, next. What is the hemolytic pattern of Yersinia species in blood agar plates? Hemolytic pattern. It's actually gamma hemolytic. Really, sir? Yeah. Among all species of the Enterobacteriaceae family, it's the only one that would have a gamma hemolytic reaction. Okay. Now, zoonotic species of Yersinia pestis that have been seen in ingestion of unpasteurized milk, it's Yersinia enterocolitica. And we can use, we can identify it using um, a culture media, a different culture media, the CIN agar of uh, Sepsuludin irgasan novobiosin agar. Um, it has a specific appearance. It has a bull's eye colony appear, colonial appearance. By the way, this is the end of our discussion when it comes to... Um, when it comes to gram-negative organisms, specifically your family, the family Enterobacteria C family, okay, I have some keynotes for you guys. Um, in the, uh, I will send some. Uh, I will send a, um, a specific note, a specific chapter related to, um, Helicobacter and Campylobacter species. But I guess, um, I guess we're going to talk about it when we, when I discuss uh Vibrio family, but, but the Vibrio family. So yeah. 
that's basically it for our discussion. It's about one hour and 25 minutes. Hopefully you guys have um, understood some of the things and you've, uh, you've supplemented your um, third year uh, third year information related to this particular topic. So hopefully uh, hopefully by next week we get to see each other. I apologize again for uh, being absent in today's lecture. Um, I do want to have a, I do want to have an interact an interactive discussion with you guys because I want you guys to absorb as much information from me as possible, especially when you're taking the exams. But unfortunately, according to your professor, majority of you voted for no. When we wanted to get uh, when we, when I asked for an early discussion, but that's okay. Um, I think this video pre this video presentation is enough for you guys to get a sufficient score in your exams. So good luck to you guys, and please don't forget to um, please don't forget to watch rewatch the videos or our discussions in the exams. And I'll be sending a copy of this particular slide in the coming days. Okay, all right, so. Bye. That's the end. <laughs>